Greetings, this is Rob Redden. I happen to be the minister for the Grover Beach Church of Christ, located on the beautiful central coast of California. I appreciate you taking the time, your precious time out of the day to view this video and listen to what I have to say about God's word. I've been preaching on grace at our church for several weeks now. And I've been recording these uh, messages beforehand and so that you, if you're interested, can follow this series because I think it's very critical because there is so much misunderstanding upon this subject. This is part three of this particular series. And, and I mentioned from time to time that it's necessary to address the issue of faith and works because there seems to be as much misunderstanding about faith and works as there is about grace. And usually the error is connected between the two. And so we're going to look at James 2, 14 through 26, because that's the critical passage that we must address. And before we get into it, let me just read those verses from 14 through 26. I'm reading from the New American Standard update. What use is it, brethren, if someone says he has faith and does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being by itself. But someone, someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize you, O foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, upon the altar? You see that faith was working with his uh, faith was working with his works, and as a result of his works, his faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. <clears throat> you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? But just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. In this chapter, we discover how faith and works may be used incorrectly because of multiple meanings. And the word for this is equivocation. You know, comics make a living with jokes using equivocation. Abbott and Costello's Who's on First is a classic example of equivocation. Most of us are familiar with, in the local area, Nan's used bookstore, the marquee letter sign on 13th and Grand in Grover Beach that displays a joke based upon multiple meanings of words. A good example of equivocation is this hypothetical story. A father came in from a good run and entering his home soaking wet with sweat, he tells his daughter who is playing on the floor with building blocks that he just ran around eight blocks. And she laughs. Why would a grown man run around eight building blocks on the floor? The father looks down and laughs because he knows why she was laughing. That's the world of comedy, equivocation. But it also affects our daily lives because often we misunderstand each other because we, use, uh, we understand a word differently from the way it was intended by the speaker or the writer. And so this chapter shows us how faith can be used incorrectly as well as works must be used correctly, and often they're not. 
To force contradiction between Paul and James fails to realize the principle of equivocation. Paul was using works in a different way than James was. Although the word works can be defined as something you do, the underlying context determines how the writer is using the word work. Well, this chapter is very important. And, but before we get into this, we need to grasp some basic principles of interpretation of inspired literature. We're talking about the 27 books of the New Testament in particular. If writer A writes in a positive way about religious works, and another writer, inspired writer B, writes in a negative way about religious works, we must believe they, they do not contradict each other since both messages are from God, who is holy and perfect and could never, ever inspire contradictions. Now, a contradiction means that either one of the two are wrong or both are wrong, but both cannot be correct. For example, if two children say two plus two equals five and seven respectively, both are wrong. But if one says four and the other says five, only one is right. Thus, Paul does not contradict James and James does not contradict Paul because they're addressing two different situations. James is talking about works for Christians. Paul is talking about works to obtain forgiveness for the non-Christian. But it also involves our mindset about works, even as a Christian, because many of the things that Paul was writing was also addressing those that would bind law for justification, which Paul says is works, salvation, which is contrary to grace. But James does not contradict grace because he's defining true faith, which Paul would agree with. And that is a faith that is true before God must express itself in obedience. Now, once again, Paul was combating mostly Judaizers who were Jewish Christians who believed that the Gentile converts must obey the law of Moses to be saved. That destroys grace. And my favorite verse for this, and I hope you'll remember it, is Romans 11 and verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And so, James was combating those who wanted to just believe intellectually or emotionally without committing to the will of God once one becomes a child of God. And we'll explore this point in this lesson as we look at the teachings of this passage of James 2, 14 through 26. You know, faith is the key doctrine of Christianity. We're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8. And we must be, as believers, we must walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. And without faith, we cannot please God, Hebrews eleven six. 6. And whatever is of not of faith is sin, Romans 14, 23. Now, the latter verse addresses the point that we must believe we are obeying God even in matters of religious opinion. You know, someone said, faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequences. When we read Hebrews 11 in the New Testament, we see all those heroes of faith in the Old Testament period being used by the Hebrews author to show what faith is all about. We see it manifested in what they did as a result of their faith. 
16 heroes of faith are mentioned and nameless Israelites and prophets and women to drive home the point that a saving faith is an obedient faith. Now, this is how this chapter is finished, beginning with verse 35. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting the release so that they might attain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. Those of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. All these have gained the approval through their faith did not receive what was promised. They didn't see the spiritual fulfillment of the prophecies of the coming Christ. God provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. In our passage, we discover James declaring the true meaning of faith. And it is this, and I'll ask a question to answer it. What kind of faith saves? Is it necessary for a believer to perform works of faith? How can a person tell whether or not one's faith is true saving faith? These are questions James answers in his passage. In one terse statement, we capture the meaning. The faith that saves is the faith that obeys. That's what I get out of James 2. And many who do not believe this will not, according to God, make it to heaven. This is not judgmental. It is biblical. Otherwise, James is not inspired. And who will go there? In verses 14 through 17, the first distortion of faith is what he calls a dead faith. Let me read to you verses 14 through 17. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, be filled, yet you do not give him what is necessary for their body, what use is it? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead at being by itself. Now, James' example tells us that he's talking to believers here, brother or sister, Christian descriptions of believers. It is the faith of these believers that are being questioned, not that they are non-Christians. He sandwiches by saying, what use is it before this illustration is given and after it's given? First, he says, what use is it if believers say he has faith but not works? If a Christian is down and out and poor and all one does is wish him well and sends him on his way, how can that faith be real? And then he says, what use is that kind of faith? It is, as James says, a dead faith being by itself. Remember what Jesus said. To those that were saved, to the extent that you have done it to one of these, the least of my brothers, you have done it to me. And he lists all the kind things that should be done by the Christian. And we can put it under the category of Christian good deeds or works. And that was in verse 40, but in 45, he shows just the opposite. And he says, to the extent that you have not done it to one of these least of my brothers, you did not do it to me. To show you how serious Jesus is in verse 41, then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, 
which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Look at this characterization of dead faith. It's purely intellectual. It substitutes words for deeds. It can quote Bible verses, but their walk does not match their talk. It makes big claims, but is not backed up by action. Call it what you want. An intellectual mindset, mental assent, it's nodding the head in agreement with doctrine about the Bible and God and Christ, but not moved to do what God requires. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter to the kingdom of heaven. That's a dead faith. And then Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? That's dead faith. Let me ask you this. Are there any commandments from God that we can ignore and refuse to obey? and go to heaven. If we only obey the ones that we agree with, what is it if it's not a dead faith? That's an intellectual faith. Many people are good, not because they are obeying God, but because it's, the, it's their chosen or inherited moral code. This can be true of atheists as well as those who believe in God. Works, worship, Baptism, Lord's Supper, are all tests of faith. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, 25 through 37, we see the difference between true faith and a dead faith. A man had been attacked, injured, and robbed, was lying on the road that connects Jerusalem and Jericho, and possibly dying. Two religious leaders, a priest and a Levite, came by and walked on the other side and wouldn't even look at the man and went on their way. And after they passed by without lifting a finger to help the poor helpless man, a Samaritan, who was considered worse than a dog to the Jews, stopped and assisted the man, bound up his wounds, and took him to the nearest inn and paid for a stay there for recovery and told him, the innkeeper, that he promised to come back and pay more if he had to stay long to recover from his injuries. And he would pay for it. Now, the priests and the Levite were religious men. They had religious duties at the temple, and they carried on their religious duties in a very deeply devout manner, I'm sure. But they rationalized their responsibility by assuming that they were already doing their duty and weren't responsible to show kindness to this harmed man. He needed help, and they ate from the religious smorgasbord that satisfied that the faith that they had. And Jesus spoke about them in Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. There you have it. Faith without works or works without faith. Both are dead faith. In verse 20, James says, are you willing to recognize that faith without works is useless? You see, James addresses the real issue here. People need to recognize that their faith is not acceptable to God because they do not demonstrate true faith by obedience. God does not allow us to pick and choose what we are to do in demonstrating our faith. God sets the tests, and we must pass the test in obedience and not choosing the ones we want. Can you imagine a person is taking a test for a job and he looks over this hundred questionnaire, hundred questions, and he reads rapidly through that and he only has an hour. And so he reads through that and he decides which ones to answer. And he leaves half a dozen or more unanswered. Do you think he passes the test? by choosing only the ones he wants to answer? 
when we pick and choose the commands of God to answer in obedience and leave the others undone, we fail the test. <clears throat> you know, somebody says, well, don't lay that guilt on me. God is a God of love and you're being judgmental. Let me ask the question. Do you believe anyone can go to heaven if they know God's will and reject doing it? How you answer that question determines whether or not your faith is real before God. Not only does James introduce intellectual assent, the intellectual nodding of the head, faith. But he also introduces another kind of faith that is not acceptable to God. And I would designate this as demoniac faith in verses 18 and 19. Now, by demoniac, I mean the demons demonstrate a type of faith that displeases God and it is a way that many people disbelieve God and have a flawed faith, a type of faith that displaces God. Verses 18 and 19. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. This may shock the complacent reader using demons, Satan's angels to show them faith only is not enough. Now the demons intellectually believe that Jesus was the son of God and God in the flesh and ultimately one to sentence them to eternal judgment. They knew the truth. In Mark 3, 11, when the unclean spirit saw him, they fell down before him and shout, you are the son of God. In Luke 8, 31, they were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Mark 8, 29, they cried out saying, what business do we have with each other, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? In Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the Jewish Shema that is uttered at every Jewish service is a foundational truth of Judaism and Christianity. And the demons believed it. What is James saying? You can have a perfect belief in doctrine, scriptural doctrine, and have a perfect understanding of it. But if you aren't moved to do what God asks you, you are no better off than the devil and his angels. And hell was made for the devil and his angels, the demons, and Matthew 25 and verse 41. But unlike dead faith that was basically only intellectual, this faith is not only intellectual, but emotional. It says they shudder. That word only occurs once in the New Testament, but it occurs in the classic writings of the Greek, the secular writings. And it means basically to shudder, to tremble, or the hair bristling from fear. This fear is an emotional response. But it's just one kind of emotion that shows that faith is not real. Many people are emotional when it comes to God. They even cry as they think about Jesus on the cross. Many people who watched the Passion of the Cross broke down and cried, but after they settled down, they went on as usual without changing their lives. Or they remained content with faith only as a caricature of true faith that serves God in their way rather than God's way. James has demonstrated that intellectual faith and an emotional faith is not enough. You need it. But if that's all you have, it's a dead faith. 
Finally, in James 2, 20 through 26, he talks about the true faith, a living and dynamic faith. He says, beginning with verse 20, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son upon the altar? When you see that faith has work, it was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? And just as the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without works is dead. Now, Abraham was declared righteous by his faith in Genesis 15, 6. But it wasn't a dead faith, an intellectual faith, nor just an emotional faith. But it was already an obedient faith. Hebrews, we discover 11 in verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed going by going out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. That's recorded in chapter 12. Who would argue that Abraham's faith wasn't linked with his obedience? It's very clear in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8. In verse 21, James says he was justified by works when he offered Isaac according to God's command in, in, in Genesis 22. We have that record. How was he justified if he was already justified at this time, by this time? Because his faith was perfected. You know, Justification is not a just one-time act, but a continual process. There is initial justification, and then the blood of Christ continues affecting justification, keeping us righteous before God. His works or obedience continue to show that his faith was real faith. This exposes the doctrine that one cannot lose saving faith once he has it. Otherwise, James is not telling the truth. You know, think about it. Abraham, a hundred years old, and over the, uh, um, when he had his son, and now, I don't know, maybe his son was 17 years old. So Abraham is getting up there, and all these years he's waited for this son, and now he has it, and that is the apple of his eye his joy of his life, comfort in his old age. Abraham may have been distracted by his son of promise and that God was becoming second place. Therefore, God needed to put him to the test and make him choose God over his son. It was a real test of faith. None of us will ever be put to the test like this, but this does not mean he doesn't test us. When we choose comforts over commitment, when we choose loved ones over God, when we choose our own path instead of God's, we fail the test. James could not have chosen a more extreme opposite of Abraham when he chose Rahab the harlot, to illustrate the place of obedience. When the Israelites were about to take the land of God, uh, the land God promised them, Joshua sent spies into Jericho to check out their defenses. These spies entered into the inn of Rahab, which was also a house of prostitution. No doubt this was the easiest way for strangers not to attract attention and suspicion. The spies warned Rahab what was coming, and they needed for her to protect them. She confessed her belief in the God of Israel because of all that she had heard, 
how that God had delivered them from their enemies supernaturally. And so she hid them and saved them from being discovered and put to death. She only asked that they spare her life and her family once God destroyed the city. She saved these men and they told her to hang out a scarlet cord outside her second story window and gather her parents and siblings in that room. Joshua 2 and chapter 6. Because she obeyed, she believed she was spared by that faith. She was not only saved, but became a convert. And it also is found in the genealogy of Jesus. That was a great reward for not only faith, but works. Abraham and Rahab show us that whether you are a believer or an unbeliever, your faith, in order for it to be demonstrated as real, must show itself in obedience. And then James concludes with verse 26. Just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Could there be any greater cap on this? The icing on the cake, the closing argument than this. What is the difference between a deceased person and a living person? One's soul or his spirit is gone. After this departs, the body is dead. It is lifeless. What is more graphic than this? To imprint upon our minds and our hearts that faith without works is dead. Earlier in this passage, James says, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. James says, show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. You really can't have one without the other. Works can't save, but faith alone can't save either. You know, we hear a lot about faith only from those who deny the necessity of baptism. But you look at the 260 chapters in the New Testament and every one of the 7,967 verses, and you will find faith only in one verse, and it is in James 2 and verse 17. Even so, if it has no works, faith is dead, being by itself or as one translation renders it, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Faith alone, faith only, is dead. Do you have a living, dynamic faith that moves you to obey whatever you discover to be God's will? It is important that each professing Christian examine his own heart and life and make sure he possesses saving faith. After all, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, examine yourselves, whether you're in the faith, prove your own selves. And I will leave that with you as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. <clears throat> Father God, we ask you to increase our faith. May we be motivated by your love and wrath against rebellion. Open our hearts to receive your word and be moved to action in our service to you in worship and in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, I want to thank you for sharing your precious time with me today. And I hope these lessons that center on grace are helpful and in your spiritual walk. Now, I want to invite you to attend a Church of Christ near you. We meet at 202 South 8th Street in Grover Beach, one block south of the Main Street Grand Avenue at 11 o'clock Sunday mornings. 
We also have a class at 10 o'clock. Now, before I close, I will prayerfully ask that God may be may bless you and keep you safe until we next week when I will present another lesson from God's word. Good day. <laughs>